say afterwards, no, nah, I know why you don't anymore. <laughs> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now just on my side. Angels descending, bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Okay, let's get caught up. 
up on all the uh, sick and, and everything that's going on in that respect. Uh, Bruce, again, was not feeling well today. Today, again, it uh, uh, may be because of the pollen, and we pray that that's all that it is, obviously. Um, but again, pollen makes us all miserable this time of year. And I don't know about you, but about this time of year, I love the rain simply because of that. Okay, that's just, that's just me. Um, we also need to remember in our prayers, uh, Betty's sister Phyllis, how's she doing? Okay, all right, so she fell in vocal vertebra, but again, she's trying to recover, so let's remember her. We need to remember Celeste Peters' mother, who had surgery for his colon cancer. Uh, Jeff Novich is asking prayers for his mother, as she's not eating, and sister-in-law Kimberly, uh, who has lung cancer. Karen Dorsey's brother, Lynn, has lung cancer. We need to remember Laura Salinas and Margie Gaddis and, and all the Salinas family, as they're continuing to work through all their aches and pains and struggles. Uh, Tanya, this is a friend of Michelle, had her kidneys removed. And also Pat and Dominic Camiso is asking for prayers for their son, Nick. So keep them in mind. Please also remember the folks in the nursing home. Susan Jackson, Berlin Height, um, Dorothy Kaysen, and uh, Tina Broadway. Let's remember all of them in our prayers. Anybody else that I did not mention? Oh, you're just waving. Okay. There's a bat. Huh? There's a bat. Okay. Uh, update on the Camiso's daughter-in-law. Uh, basically, they said the, a miracle is about it. The cancer is spreading throughout her body despite treatment. So. Okay, so we do need to remember them in our prayers, obviously. All right, anybody else? I'll be having my uh, second um, cataract surgery tomorrow, 7 o'clock. So pray that all go just as good as the first one. Okay. Anybody else? Definitely keep you in prayer. Anybody else? Going once? Going twice? Just scratching my head. Sold. <laughs> Again, very, very glad you all are here. Brother, would you lead us in a word of prayer? Thank you. Let's get the prayer. Oh, Father, no, God, we come to you this time. We thank you so much for all the blessings, Father, that you so richly give us, Lord. We know all good and perfect gifts come from you, and we thank you so much for that. We realize, Father, we are not deserving, but it's because of your love, your grace, and your mercy that you see fit to be favorable to us. And we, we thank you so much. We thank you for each one who's gathered here tonight. We pray, Father, a blessing for each one. We pray, Lord, that we'll be encouraged by their presence, and they'll be encouraged by ours. We pray, Lord, as we study the word tonight that we will uh, attend to it, Father, and that we will uh, gain something and that we can apply it to our lives and we can be better servants for you. But we know that that's what we are. We are all our servants. And we pray, Father, that we will always have that servant attitude, always looking to serve you and to serve others, Father, uh, because we realize, Lord, that uh, that is the way that you are being seen through this day by the light that we shine good deeds that we do, and they know that uh, we serve you, Father. Lord, we a prayer for all of those who are mentioned that are sick, uh, family, Father, the uh, relatives of families, Lord, we friends, we pray, Father, that you meet each one of those needs. We pray that you meet our brother Bruce tonight, and we pray, Lord, that uh, the allergies won't uh, attack him that much, Father, that he will regain strength, Father, and we be all right. We pray for all the others, Father, who suffer from allergies during this time of year, Father. We pray, Lord, that uh, you will comfort them and you will just help them to uh, be cautious and uh, to uh, maintain, Father. Lord, we know, like the song says, that you will take care of us. Many times we have weights, we have struggles, we have things that we're trying to solve ourselves, Lord, but we know we can't do it without you. And you'll take care of us. All we have to do is just take one day at a time. And we pray, Lord, that we can be mindful of that when we are going through diff difficult times. Lord, we ask that you uh, be with the bereaved, uh, those who have lost loved ones. Pray, Lord, that you will comfort them, Father. Be with South Park, Lord. Help us to grow the way you would have us, Father, in both uh, spiritual.
spiritual father and father in reaching out to the lost to bring more souls to you. Lord, we pray for the leaders here. We pray that you will continue to bless us and uh, help us to always uh, uh, be in accordance with your will and, and, and consult your word, Father, for all the decisions that have to be made. Be with us as we do that, Lord. Be with the Bible school teachers, Father, and bless them, help them in their studies, Father. And we pray, Lord, that you would just meet all of our needs. Father, there is sometimes uh, we go through things and we don't uh, let others know, Father, but you know what's going on. We pray that you would uh, help us in this area. Be with Brother Tommy tonight as he conducts the class, Father. Give him a regular remembrance of the things he studied and help him to be able to impart to us that in a way that we could uh, be able to gain strength, gain knowledge, and apply it to our lives. Forgive us for our sins, Lord. So many times we say, do, and think things we should. And we are sorry, Lord. Help us to be conscious of that. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right. Class is made his mess. Thanks for being here, even though the pollen is bad, it's going to rain again, it'll be better, and then the day after it's out, it's going to come back again after the rain is all dried up and everything like that, so just, just got to deal with it, right? So thank you for being here, I appreciate it, appreciate it very much. Over the last little bit, beginning the first this year, we started talking about two or three things. We talked about the Godhead, we have also talked about the idea of, of um, the idea of leadership. And I think it's something that we're trying to put all together as we're looking at it all together. So this evening I'm going to try to talk a little bit more about some leadership. And this time as we talk about it, I hope to be able to encourage and challenge all of us to do the very best that we can. And when I say all of us, I mean all of us. Okay? And I'll, I'll get to that point in just a few moments. The Bible has been around for thousands of years. It has a lot of good in it. And indeed, it tells us exactly how God is looking at it. And it's been a source of a lot of contention and dissension. And the fact that there's a lot of people that don't agree with everything that the Bible talks about. But you know, where else are we going to find what God wants? And whenever you start looking at some of the people that are in the Bible, their character, the way they live their lives, the mistakes that they made, they faced great challenges. And we'll talk about some of those this evening with faith and endurance. And think about today how important it is that we do the very same thing. So let's just look at a few of them very quickly. We'll go through it very quickly and then we'll see go from there. One of the first things that, that I think about when we think about leadership is Noah. Now remember, and I think we talked about this very briefly, but the idea that Noah in Genesis chapter 6, God looked over the world. He says what? The human race is not going to make it. It's just not going to make it. It's sinful. And again, look at all the wickedness and the so forth that was going on. And so God decides to wipe out the human race. Now, you're, you're sitting there thinking to yourself, well, I can't even really put that in my mind. But that's exactly right. That's exactly what's going on. God is going to put do away and, and start from scratch in essence. But rather than read... Uh, making the whole universe or putting another uh, Adam and Eve somewhere in some other garden just for all this stuff to start all over again. Just remind, remind you of the fact and ideal of the fact that God hopefully was wanting to start with one person or a family that could make a difference. And the guy that he chose was a fellow by the name of Noah. Now, think about Noah for just a few moments. It seemed like through all of this, he'd been the only one that hadn't been corrupted. And so God tells him to build an ark. And we talked about the idea, and I've shared this with you before, but that whole idea that through him, all the animal life is saved. And so the whole world is doing what was wrong. Noah was doing what is right. Right? Now, what's the lesson? Huh? Do what? 
I can't hear you. <laughs> what's the lesson? Do what's right. Huh? Do what's right. Do what's right. Thank you. Y'all all know by now when I've got pollen, I'm also my ears are stopped up. And when they're not stopped up, they're always ringing. So maybe that's part of the reason why I'm losing it. I'm losing it, okay? But just, just so y'all know, that's, it's, it's either ring or it's stopped up. So speak up. My wife knows that. See, she knows that situation. So think about it for just a minute. Notice as God's talked to him, he says, for you alone have I seen righteous before me in this time. The whole world, the entire world was doing things wrong, sinful, but no one was living the kind of life that God could use. We, a lot of times, talk to our young people about the idea of peer pressure. It's not just the young people that face peer pressure, we do too. We see a friend of ours that gets a better TV or a better something or other, or a brand new car or something like that, so then all of a sudden we, we kind of look at my old car and my old truck and I say, well, you know, this one's 15 years old and I don't know how much longer it's gonna last, maybe I need to go buy me another car so we get ourselves deep in debt. Or we have a friend of ours that actually encourages sin in many situations. And sometimes it's hard to fight back against that situation unless you've really got the stamina and the determination that you're going to do what God says no matter what. Think about the idea that he was going to be the one, Noah and his family, that was going to save as it was, the, the, the planet as it was. But think about this in this respect. You don't have to go along to get along. Noah made a decision and his wife and his children, and they got to build, busy building that ark. And God, whenever it came down to it, they were the only ones that were delivered. Listen to what he says in Hebrews chapter 11, the roll call of the faithful. By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness that comes by faith. By faith. Noah was able to fight it off by faith. Now, I don't know. I don't know your life. I don't know every little detail of your life. But do we live by faith? We know we ought to. We, ought, we know we ought to be understanding what God wants and expects us to do. But sometimes, brothers and sisters, we listen more to the world than we're listening to what God has said. And that's why it's so important that we really need to do this. And because of that reason, he was saving the world. All right? Again, I could spend so much more time on that, but just think about it in that respect. Secondly, going back to Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was received as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to see the live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him with the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that had foundations, whose designer and builder was God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful as she had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born his descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. In Genesis chapter 12, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your kindred, and from your father's house to the land that I'll show you. Abraham, I want you to leave family and everything else, and you just go to where I show you. Lord, where are we going? You, I'll let you know when you get there. That's called faith, right? I'll let you know when you get there. So just, just again, think about that. I'm going to make a bless you, and I'm going to make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Think about the idea. Abraham is instructed to leave his comfort zone. We all have our comfort zone. It may be our house. It may be where we go or our job or whatever it is. Something that we're very familiar with. We like our comfort zone. Amen. And whenever somebody messes with our comfort zone, then it's going to get rough, right? And that's the reality of it. So here's God saying, listen, 
I'm wanting you to leave. I'm wanting you to go to a land that I have that I'm going to show you. And Abraham says, well, where is that, Lord? Well, I'll let you know when you get there. That's faith. That's faith. Now, again, just challenge each and every one of us to think about this thing. Do I have that kind of faith? Do I read God's word and put that word into effect in my life, even though I'm not sure exactly how it's all going to work out? That's the way we ought to live. But more often than not, we try to live our lives our way. And then when everything does blow up because we try to do it our way, then maybe at that point in time, we kind of want to go back and say, well, I wish I had a do-over, right? How many of you have ever wanted a do-over? Okay, we all have. We all have. But the reality is, is that whenever we are studying God's word, whenever we look at these people here, we need to learn the lessons that they had to learn. Great leaders embrace that uncertainty, but they know the truth that the promised land awaits them on the other side. Okay, that's two guys. First off, there was Noah, then there was Abraham, and then there was a fellow by the name of Joah. Joseph, I'm sorry. Joseph. Joseph, okay? Latter part of the book of Genesis, again. His story begins in Genesis chapter 37. Think about this for just a moment. He had a tough life, didn't he? He was daddy's favorite. I'm, well, I may not need to ask that. But I started to ask, are any, were any of you when you were growing up, were you mama or daddy's favorite? Huh? Oh, and look at that. Okay, there's two, two. Anybody else? Three, three. Shall I get a four? <laughs> yeah. How did that work out with y'all when it comes to y'all? You see what I'm saying? How did that work out whenever your brothers and sisters came along? You know, or, or and, and surely you never had no disagreements with your brothers and sisters, right? Just, just, just well, I'm mama's favorite. I'm daddy's favorite. And you see, you just all the time just fighting one another because of that issue, right? Think about Joseph for just a few minutes. He was sold into slavery by his jealous brothers. Sold into slavery. They were going to kill him. But a band of Bedouins came along and they sold him off into slavery. And his father was told that he was killed by a wild animal. All right, he's living in a land that he didn't want to go to. He's away from his family now. They're pretty well written him off because they thought he was dead. That was the end of the discussion. His brothers probably, you know, wasted the money. You know what I'm trying to say there. So here he was. He sold into slavery. And so he does the best he can in the situation. And then his boss's wife comes up to him. And throws herself at him. Let's just be honest about that situation. And he refused to sleep with her. And then as a result of that, he winds up in prison. Okay? In prison. All right. So, things just got from, it got from good to bad to worse. He's in prison back in those days. And just chew on that fact for a moment. And he was there and he interpreted the dream of a prisoner who was released and restored to his position. And Joseph said, listen, I, I don't deserve to be here. I've not gone through a trial. Whether they had trials back then or not was a whole other issue. We're not sure about that. We're just kind of guessing at it. But, but I don't deserve to be here. You know, a lot of times we need to stop and think about the fact that probably most of us don't deserve to be where we are. We're blessed, richly blessed. And again, how many people have gone to prison because of crimes they didn't commit, but it was all laid on them? How would you feel if you were in that situation? I'd want some, I'd want some reparation somehow or another. I'd want somebody to pay me back. Bottom line is, so here he was. So he, he <clears throat> was in prison, and so he was restored, this prisoner that he interpreted for, was released and restored to his position. But Joseph said, please talk to Pharaoh about me. And what did the guy do? He totally forgot. Or, he, you know, he, he's out of prison now, he don't care, it's over. 
I'm, I'm where I want to be, right? He didn't care about Joseph. And so it, what happens in the end, Joseph becomes the leader of all Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. This, this guy that went through a lot, he didn't know if his mom, he didn't know if his family was still alive. He was not in prison because he had done anything. Life was not fair to him. He could have griped and carried on all day for the rest of his life because it just life isn't fair. But he didn't. He didn't. When <clears throat> he became leader of all Egypt, second only to Pharaoh himself, he delivered the Egyptians from a famine. And in the midst of this, here comes his brothers, same ones who sold him in slavery. Now, he, remember, think about this. He's now the second guy in charge of Egypt. If he wanted revenge for his brothers and what they did to him, you think he could have got it? Did he or did he not throw them in prison for a little while? Yeah. But then he called them back out. It wasn't like he was going to make them stay in prison for the rest of their lives. You see, he was trying to teach his brother something as well. And so, whenever his brother does, and Joseph says, you know what? Though you meant harm, God put me where he put me to save you. Here's the point. There are going to be times as leaders that we're going to struggle with what to do. There are going to be times whenever we try to figure out the, the best situation in difficult times. Leaders sometimes make the mistake of quitting too early. Joseph had faith in God. And that's what kept him hanging in there. And brothers, that's the sisters, that's the same thing with us. We've got to keep our faith in God. Not the preacher, not the elders, not the deacons, not certain people, not our boss. We've got to do it with God. Leaders have a vision that sustained them through difficult times. Faith is what gives us that vision. People's going to lie about us? Let them. It's not going to make no difference to me. Let them lie. Live faithful to God no matter what. Endure no matter what. So, number one, there was Noah. Number two, there was Abraham. Then you got Joseph. All right, number four, Moses. Now, what, what about the story of Moses? Y'all tell me a little bit about it. Give me a chance to get my breath a little bit. Moses. Come on, folks. We, we were in kids, we were little kids in Bible class learning all about Moses, right? Come on now. Tell me a little bit about Moses. Huh? He wasn't very bold. He wasn't very bold? Okay. Early on. He wasn't bold early on. Okay. Thank you, brother. You broke the ice. Now, come on, folks. <laughs> Did everybody forget about Moses? <laughs> His mother put him in a basket to keep him from being killed. There you go. And that's a very important point. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You think about the idea that when he's in that situation, um, Exodus chapter 3 is when he starts opening the, the stores up. And, and again, God is going to have to convince Moses that he's the guy that's going to deliver the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. Now, Moses had gone through a lot. Like what we said, he was born in the bulrushes and his sister was there watching the whole situation. By the way, let's stop for just a moment and we'll come back to Moses. And let's talk about Miriam for a moment. Now, a lot of times whenever we're starting to look at this, chew on the fact that, that um, she's the first female prophetess that we read about in the Bible. She's the one that's instrumental in saving her brother's life, Moses. Moses became a very important Jewish prophet, writing the first five books of the Old Testament, gave the Ten Commandments handwritten by God to the Israelites, 
And again, he was born during a time when Pharaoh was trying to kill all the newborn children just to keep down the population of the Jewish nation. Moses, or Miriam helped her mother, Jochebed, hide Moses for three months, Hebrews 11, verse 23. You see, sometimes, and I want to just challenge you to think about this, we read a lot of times, and we've been doing this, about a lot of the men in the Bible that led, led but you know, behind the scenes, there's always those good women that are doing the job that needs to be done. And here was Jochebed, going to do her best and, and trying to save her son, and Miriam was going to help the whole thing out. you got to realize that they were putting their lives on the line. Because again, Pharaoh was bound to determine that all the male's children was going to be killed. And whenever again they couldn't hide him, they placed him among the reeds on the bank of the Nile, and Pharaoh's daughter discovered Moses. Now, we start reading through that. We say, boy, what a lucky circumstance. No, 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 no. This is God's providence. This is God's providence. Does God providentially still work for us today? Yes, he does. We may not even really notice it when it's going on. But there are probably many situations in our lives that we, we kind of dismiss or something without even thinking about it in that respect. Whenever they could no longer hide him, then again... Pharaoh's daughter discovered Moses. She adopts him. And now what? He becomes very important. And he had grown up as it was as Pharaoh's daughter. So he knows all the ins and the outs of the Egyptian way of life. And he is, in a sense, because it is Pharaoh's daughter, who saved Moses, he's now what? He's now part of the family. Right? That just happened by accident. Right? No. God doesn't do things by accident. And whenever he knew what was going, because he knew what the future was going to hold, and he really, think about this in this respect, he, know that, he knew that Moses was going to be the one that was going to lead his people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Don't ever second guess God. God knows what he's doing. And so as you look at this, you see that all this was going on. Miriam orchestrated for Moses to be nursed and raised by his own mother until the time to be handed over to Pharaoh's daughter. Moses became Israel's deliverer. Moses as a type of Christ and the fact that Christ came to deliver us. And listen to what he says, Exodus 15, 20. Miriam the prophetess, Aaron's sister. Aaron's sister was also Moses' sister. Took a tambourine in her hand and all the women followed her with their tambourines and danced. She had, obviously, to be a person that had to be reckoned with. Ladies, don't ever sit back and say that you're not important. You are. You're vital. In every family, you're vital to the church. Again, as I sit back sometimes and look at us as men and the women, and I sit back and see that sometimes the women are doing a lot more than the men are. I'm not going to hear an amen on that one, are they? I could at least allow the women to say amen if you want to. <laughs> you see what I'm trying to say? But honestly, think about that for just a moment. It, it, it's the truth. I'm being honest. Thank you, ladies, for what you do. She was, went down in history as someone who led all the women in Israel into acknowledging the God of Israel. Okay. Exodus 12, verse 29. It came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne to the captains. Mm -hmm. That kind of would have been maybe rough. Maybe. Firstborn of Pharaoh. Yeah. It, it's, it's, there's a lot of things there that we're not privy to in that respect, but yeah, there's 
There's a lot of things that's, that's juggling on right there, right? There really is. And this is something else that I've thought a lot about. And sometimes my opinion, my opinion and that will get you, you know, I, I don't even have any money to give you to where you can buy a coat. But the bottom line is, as you read through the Bible, God is always orchestrating things. He sets up kings, he brings kings down. He set up Pharaoh, he brings Pharaoh down. So we get all wrapped up and tied up about the government of the United States and who's in charge and who's not and all this other stuff. And we're sitting there thinking, well, if we just get the guy that we want in charge, everything is going to be just perfectly fine. And I'm sometimes, I don't know exactly how it works out. I, I don't think because I don't have the mind of God. But God will allow us, think about this, to choose whoever we want even if they're the most wicked person in the world. Back in the days of Moses, there was no election. It was the oldest son of Pharaoh, the next oldest son of Pharaoh, and that's the way it went, right? But here in this whole situation in the story of Moses, Pharaoh and his army was defeated, right? Because this is what God wanted. So maybe sometimes when we get a little bit upset or frustrated because of the way we think things are going, if they're not going right or whatever, just remember God's in charge of all of this. Just remember that. And sometimes we throw our chest out and sit back and say, well, my guy won or my guy didn't or whatever. And the bottom line of the situation is, how do we know? How do we know if God didn't make a choice to make it that way? Something to challenge you about. And whenever y'all get it all figured out, come talk to me about it because I'd like to know a little bit more, okay? Another guy, a fellow by the name of Joshua. Joshua chapter 24. After leading the people into a new land, Joshua offers the Israelites the option to serve the God whom they always served, the one who brought them into the land of, of Canaan, or they could serve the gods of the surrounding land. But we remember that great statement he says in Joshua 24, what? After summoning all the elders, he said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that again emphasizes something that we've seen already all, earlier, whenever we were talking about this a little bit, the idea of Joseph making the right decisions, even in situations that caused him to be in prison. He still made the right decisions. Here was Joshua. I'm going to do what the Lord wants me to do. As me and my house, we're going to do that. Again, there's a great lesson there for all of us. And again, the people all said that we're going to do what God wants us to do. They believed in Joshua's leadership. But what happens when a leader dies? What happened right after Joshua died? They were being run by the judges and those judges, if you look go through the whole book of Judges, you had some good ones, you had some bad ones. You had some people that were trying to do what God wanted them to do and you had a bunch that didn't. And then you have some where you just kind of scratch your head, like Samson, he was one of those judges, right? But it's kind of like, wait a minute, Whose side are you on here, John? And Samson? I mean, seriously. And it wasn't until that last battle that he died. And we finally see whose side he was on. But all through it, he was going back and forth. And I mean, as you begin, you read through there, the sad tragedy of it is, and I'm not trying to be, uh, you think about all the, all the ladies that he had. You know what I'm saying? That's the way he was. That's the way he lived. And God used him, but after that, you know, God's the one who decided where he's going to spend eternity. Usually, though, after the leaders die, what happens to the people? Huh? And they go back into sin. If you had a good guy leading, they'd go back into sin. You know, we'd always kind of just go back to what we were doing. This We... <clears throat> I see this sometimes in the church. I see this in my own life. Sometimes it's the hard way 
It's the hard way that you don't find many people going down because it's so hard. But a lot of people, even leaders, go the path of least resistance and try to make everybody happy. As we are now in this election year, what do we hear from everybody? I'm gonna make your life all better, right? I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do all this other stuff. And in the meantime, we racked up a $4 trillion debt that our children are gonna to have to pay eventually. Well, if we just throw enough money at it, it'll solve the problem, right? It's always worked, right? No. So you see what I'm trying to say here? You see the points that I'm trying to make? And, and it doesn't matter. You've got the guys on the Republican side and the uh, Democrat side both ways. Right? <clears throat> another guy. Another leader. A fellow by the name of David. We start his story off in 1 Samuel chapter 17. The Israelites are being defeated by the Philistines and a nine foot tall giant. Now all of our kids love that story, right? <laughs> they love the story of David and Goliath. That's the beautiful part of it right there. And so they're all there, they pitch in the camp together and the Philistines were gathering for battle and they gathered at Sokos and so they might be able to begin to attack. So here this nine foot tall giant and he is taunting the Israelites and challenges them to come send him a man. And if that man should defeat him, the Philistines would become their servant. And all those Israelites, they're just hunkered down saying, I'm not going out there with that nine foot tall giant. No, that's not gonna happen. This was a huge man, nine foot tall. He probably was very muscular. He knew how to fight because that's the way he lived his life. So he, you know, David is this small boy. What, what's going on here? Well, it's Goliath. And we're not going to, and David said, well, he's just a guy. Let's go out there and get him. No. Well, if, you, if you're willing to do it, David, you're the only one. Um, what's going to happen if I do it? You're going to marry the king's daughter. You're going to be in the, you're going to be in the royal household. And David's like, okay. Well. So what does he do? He goes out and picks up five smooth stones out of a creek. He didn't take the armor. He tried to put the armor on. He said, I can't do this. I, I, I can't do anything. I can't do anything this way. And so think about that whole idea there. He, he's going to go out there without any armor on, and he's volunteering. And Goliath mocks, you sent out this run to challenge me? And David looks at him and he says, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, and I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts whom you've taught him. And so he takes the stone, slings it with his sling at Goliath's forehead, knocks him to the ground, picks up the guy's own sword, chops his head off. Who won? Who won? God. That's the important point. God won. He used this young man. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm just challenging you to think about the idea that maybe some of us are sitting back saying, well, I'm too old to do stuff like that now. I don't need to be out fighting Goliaths and stuff like that. But listen, in every one of our lives, there's going to be these Goliaths. And they're going to taunt us. And they're going to do the very best they can to get us to do what they want them to do. Satan is back there whispering in their ear. Friends, colleagues, they're trying to do their very best to get you to go back to what God wants. You've got battles just like all of us do. And we've got to realize that we can't be afraid of the, of the giants. One guy said, you can face any challenge as long as you have conviction and strength and resolve on your side. Unless you're convicted for sure that you got it. And then you've got that strength. And this brings up a whole other question, which is for a whole other Bible class. I think about the idea that, that God often tells us he expects us to live by faith. There's something to be said about that. We've got to. I mean, that's just it. I do what I do by faith. I come to worship by faith. 
But sometimes I think we, I, try to do all this stuff on my own. And I don't get God in the picture. And what winds up happening? It's usually not very good, right? We're there, we're here to do God's will. But sometimes I think we try to do so much that we've lost what God really needs for us to do. Your thoughts? Yeah. Sometimes we may overstep. Huh? Sometimes it seems we may overstep. Uh, what I mean by that is maybe our walk is in faith. Maybe we don't understand that we must do what you're really supposed to do. Yeah. Um, we get to a point to where we look around and we're not seeing that same kind of thing. We're not seeing around us. Yeah. And if you live by faith, you're supposed to do what you're supposed to do. Yeah. That's right. I know you didn't hear him because I just barely did. <laughs> but that's okay, brother. I, no, that's okay. I understand. No problem. No problem. Um, plus, I've got hearing problems anyway. So just keep that in mind. He said a lot of times we try to do things for God, but uh, in essence, we're trying to do it our way, not God's way. You know, people want to be saved, but I want it done my way. I just want to say a little prayer, and I expect God to forgive me and take me to heaven, right? Or do I really have to go to church every Sunday? What about every third Sunday? What about every other Sunday? See, we're trying to make it our way, and we expect God to do it our way. When he's saying all along, no, 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 this is not what it's about. You've got to do it my way. And that's why we've got to spend more and more and more time in God's Word to make sure we're doing it His way. And sometimes we do pat ourselves on the back saying, well, look what I've done. God may not be impressed with what we've done unless it's His will. So there's something to be said about that. How many times, again, do we really seek God's will and God's purpose in our lives as we're trying to struggle through, or struggle through some of this stuff? All right, so we've talked about Moses, Noah, Joseph, Abraham, Miriam, Joshua, David. Let's go to another guy, a fellow by the name of uh, Isaiah. Isaiah. <clears throat> In Isaiah 6, God is asking who he should send as a prophet to his people. And I love what Isaiah said. Here am I, what? Send me. Okay, we sing the song, right? But are we serious about it? Here am I, Lord, send me, send me, let me go. Here am I, send me. Leaders don't wait to see if anyone else is going to step up when something needs to be done. Leaders are going to do what they can at that moment in time. They're going to do what they need to do. They take initiative. They're the first to raise their hands. They're the first to stand. The first to speak up. They're the first to make decisions. Leaders, the kind of leaders God won't shun in action and are always ready to take the plunge at a moment's notice. And you see, that's a challenge for all of us. Again, we've got to be willing to speak up, stand, raise our hands, do what needs to be done. And that's not just men, but also women too, right? And I, I got to say this about you ladies, and I'm going to be honest, I've said it before, but when I look and see you, I see you're really working, especially when there's that time you're uh, putting all these, these foods together and you're going visiting these people and you're doing this and you're doing that, I commend you. We men, we've got to do the same thing. We've got to be out there visiting, doing what we can, encourage, making decisions to help people. And, and again, all that's going on right now is we're trying to do what God wants and God expects of us to do. So we're challenging one another. And I think that's what he's trying to emphasize to us here. Isaiah was... Rising to the occasions, he was going to do whatever needed to be done at that moment in time. <clears throat> I've got, I've got a good bit more, but I see he's going back to about to ring the bell, so <laughs> hang in there with me, okay? All right. One last guy, and this is going to be it. A fellow by the name of Daniel. 
All of us know about Daniel. What do we remember about Daniel? Thank you. That's what every little kid, that's what all the kids remember that he was thrown in the lion's den. What got him there to begin with? He refused to bow down. That's right. He refused to bow down. I mean, it, the bottom line is he, he's a highly esteemed government official. His colleagues become jealous and they convince the king to enact a decree saying that prayer can be made to no God but to the king. Okay. What does Daniel do? Well, he doesn't stomp around and talk about how stupid the king was. He doesn't sit there and gripe about everything that was going on in his life. What did he do? He kept on praying. He kept on doing exactly what he was doing. And when he was caught, his colleagues tell the king, and they forced to throw Daniel into the den of lions. And the next day, I mean, think about it. The king couldn't even get a week of sleep that night. He gets up first thing in the morning, runs to the lions. Dan, Daniel, are you still there? <clears throat> he said, yes. My God, save me. Yeah. And you see, now all of a sudden, what's happened? The king now knows who God really is. The king also knows who the man is standing for, God. And that's the kind of man that we need. He's not going to recant. No matter what happened to him, great leaders follow this example. We've got to stay steadfast in our conviction, no matter what happens. Did you hear that? We have to stay steadfast in our convictions, no matter what happens. And brothers and sisters, that's the challenge, right? That's the challenge in the world today. That's it. Five minutes left. I'll get one more quick lady in here, all righty. A lady by the name of Deborah. She too was a prophetess. And she was the only female judge in the history that you read of the judges. Okay? Think about she also, <laughs> interestingly enough, and this is one something I've often seen myself. A lot of times in families, in family units, in church, and in other places, a lot of times the women step up to the plate when the men don't. Am I being honest, guys? I've got one, two, three guys in here, not four guys in here. Okay, so we're, out, uh, we're outnumbered, but that, hey, that's showing something right here, isn't it? I mean, let's also be honest about that. That's showing something right here. So the bottom line is, is a lot of times that when men don't do the job, the women are going to step up and do it. And that means that we've got to be a better, better doing at that. That's, I think, what's happening here. She led the Israelites to victory and out of bondage. She was a, the fourth judge in the time of the judges. And she was, think about this, the only other person that was referred to as both a prophet and a judge in the Bible of Samuel. She was a prophet and a judge. She lived in the 12th century B.C. And she think about, some people seem to think that she may have led that group of people for about 60 years. That's a long time to hold on to power, right? I wouldn't want to do that for that long. But just imagine that for a moment. What's interesting in all of this is that her leadership was appreciated and accepted by both men and women. But again, it emphasizes the idea that <clears throat> Deborah's story is a radical departure from the standard biblical themes which rarely place women in roles as warriors and, gen and generals. So the bottom line is she was there. Barak insisted that Deborah go, Deborah go with him to the war. They won the battle. Who got the, who got the praise? Deborah. You don't hear too much about Barak, do you? But you do remember who? Deborah. Why? Because this woman was being used by God. So, <clears throat> think about that for just a few moments. Sometimes whenever there is a vacuum in the leadership, somebody's going to step in and be the leader. 
Brothers and sisters, let's continue to study this. I'm not going to try to go back and, and go through everything that Bruce was, and that's part of the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing tonight. But I've given you some things to think about. As members of the church, we've been given a commission to spread the gospel to the whole world. Women can do that with other women and talk to other women. And sometimes when they're talking to somebody that's not even a Christian man, sometimes that's a good thing. Because sometimes, I think sometimes uh, me and my wife have had Bible studies sometimes. And, and Tommy always likes to, uh, not, he doesn't mean to do it, but Tommy sometimes sits back and tries to let everybody know how much I know. And my wife in one sentence will summarize everything I've spent for the last 30 minutes. God bless her for that. God gave her what God gave me what I needed, and I'm grateful for that too. So, brothers and sisters, we all can have a part in making a difference in this world. Don't just sit back and say, I give up, I quit. God expects us to be involved. Let's give it the best we've got. All right? Any other comments, questions, thoughts? Yes, yes.